Argentina. Morning, Seacoast. Thank you all for braving the rain, the uh, wetness out there, or uh, I guess we're actually doing okay so far. Just sprinkles this morning, is that right? All right. Well, uh, prayerfully, we'll get you out of here before the deluge comes. Um, Tell you what, I could have done with a lot more singing from our worship team this morning. You too? I want to thank uh, JL, Camille, and Bill, obviously, for doing a great job. Uh, Yeah. And let's remember Kaleo and Emmy, who are getting married today. That's why they're not here. So uh, if you're thinking about them today, uh, pray for them. Pray for the wedding, pray for the marriage, pray for the honeymoon, and for uh, blessings all the way around. Um, Also, since we're talking about marriage and stuff, I've got good news to report. Uh, Many of you know Amy Phillips and Josh Klepper. They've been with our... Uh, church since they were in youth group. Uh, They're still with us now, and they just announced their engagement yesterday. So we're super happy for them. Congratulations, Amy and Josh. All right, so let's get on with this. Good morning, you masterpieces of the Most High, (laughs) royal heirs of the King of Kings, wonderfully made works of art for the purpose of doing good works that God preordained you for. Don't tell me you've already forgotten. It's only been a week. All right, welcome to week five of our Building Up series. Uh, In case you forgot who you are or you missed last week and you don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, Last week, we talked about building up self-esteem. We talked about who we were created to be and who we are in Christ. You can go back, watch that on our Seacoast Redondo YouTube channel if you'd like. Um, In previous weeks of this series, we've talked about building up others, ways to build up others using more than words, and building up courage. And you can check out all of those on our YouTube channel. By the way, when you're there, do us a favor. And if you're watching this online right now, please subscribe and smash that like button. All right. No, but seriously, uh, do that. Leave a comment down below. It helps the algorithm like us a little better and get our stuff out to more people. So uh, thank you for helping. Uh, Today, we're going to be talking about building up faith. This is going to be at least a two-parter here, um, talking about building up our faith in what we believe, and then living like we really have that faith. And I know that there's a lot of semantics that come into play when we say the word faith. Um, For the purpose of this week, I want to clearly define the faith that we're talking about as reasons to believe, specifically reasons to believe in Jesus. Now, personally, I think that belief, faith, trust in Jesus is the main thing at stake. And I think the Apostle Paul would agree uh, when you read what he writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 17. If Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. But see, I also recognize that in order to get to faith in Christ, there's a lot of other questions that people have to deal with. There's faith in a lot of other things that have to develop hand in hand along with faith in Christ, uh, whether because they are directly related or indirectly related. So um, the things we're talking about, we're talking about reasons to believe in God, period, before we get to reasons to believe in the Son of God. We'd be talking about reasons to trust what the Bible says about Jesus and extra biblical proofs for God and Jesus within science and history and archaeology and even philosophy, Any one of those topics has about a hundred subcategories and arguments and ideas and proofs to cover. Each one could have its own lecture or message or essay written about it with the realization that there are often multiple points of view to be discussed and debated as to the conclusions that we arrive at. There is no way that today's spotlight on the topic of building up faith, reasons to believe in Jesus, is going to be in any way complete or comprehensive. Now, that said, I do want to direct you to a series that we did 
during the pandemic called Finding My Faith or Refinding My Faith. Uh, that series does deal with some of those ideas in more detail. If you're interested in reasons to believe in God and Jesus and prophecy, if you want to talk about truth, what that is. Um, in this series, we talk about the fine-tuning of the universe, uh, pointing to a design from a designer. We look at cosmological arguments for the existence of God. We talk about the Kalam cosmological argument. Everything that begins to exist has a cause, therefore the universe has a cause. We talk about prophecy. We talk about all that good stuff. So if you want a little more information about all of those things, um, that can be a solid starting point. Please feel free to check it out on our Secos Redondo YouTube channel. But again, we are Christ followers. We believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he performed miracles to prove it, that he fulfilled prophecy to prove it, and that he not only died but rose again three days later. And because of his sacrifice and subsequent resurrection, we can have eternal life and abundant life in him and through him. That's the reason we're here. That's the gospel. That is the good news that we are sharing each and every week. This is why we have hope. 1 Peter 3.15, the apostle Peter says, you must worship Christ as the Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. And there's a number of ways we can do that. But giving reasons why we can have faith in Christ, apologetics, the fancy way of saying it, is one of the ways of doing just that. Now, don't worry, you don't have to be an expert on this stuff. Some people are. Some people like to become apologetic shock troopers for good and for bad, okay? And you can read the next verse, 1 Peter 3.16, for more on the latter, all right? But I think it's a good idea for all of us to be able to know that there are good reasons for having faith in the claims of Jesus Christ, that we believe, uh, you know, what he said, what his apostles said, what his disciples and scripture says about him. We can have reasonable faith. And the first thing that we can have reasonable faith in is Jesus' existence. We can have faith that Jesus existed. Now, you may not have an issue with that out there, I don't know, but sometimes you hear this question as to whether a historical Jesus actually existed. To be honest, it's really a non-starter. With all due respect, it is literally a bad faith argument, no pun intended. Um, whether you believe Jesus was the son of God or not, the evidence for the existence of a historical Jesus is pretty much universally accepted by most serious historians or biblical scholars that study such things. Uh, Jesus not only appears in the Gospels, uh, which operate both as religious scripture and testimony, historical recordings of people and events at the time, but Jesus also appears extra biblically. He appears in the Antiquities of the Jews by Jewish historian Josephus. And Jesus is also mentioned uh, by a Roman historian, Tacitus, in his work, The Annals of Imperial Rome. Now, granted, um, these works, uh, like the Gospels themselves, uh, are dated after the events of the Gospels. Uh, in the case of the works of Josephus and Tacitus, around 93 to 116 AD, or CE, if you like that designation. Um, most estimates uh, place the authoring of the Gospels around 66 AD to 110 AD. Some even pass that. But there are others who believe the original versions of the Gospels were written before that. And most often, they state a lack of recording of major events that you would expect eyewitnesses to record in the Gospels and the Book of Acts, such as the fall of Jerusalem, the three-year period of persecution that followed, the martyrdom of early church fathers and disciples and leaders, because the Gospel records similar deaths, uh, like uh, of Stephen and John the Baptist. Um, Despite the question of date of authorship of these records, uh, Lawrence Miatuik, uh, he's an associate professor of library science at Purdue University, and he wrote an article for uh, Bible Archaeology Review, a uh, biblical archaeology review, rather, about extra biblical evidence for Jesus. He concluded there was no debate that Jesus was a historical figure and that there wasn't an argument against it in ancient times either. His quote, Jewish rabbis who did not like Jesus or his followers accused him of being a magician and leading people astray, but they never said he didn't exist. And it's important to note, the historian Josephus, who we were talking about, was not a follower of Jesus. He was born a few years after Jesus' crucifixion, but he would have grown up while the early Christian church was being 
established. Uh, he was a well-connected aristocrat and military leader during the first Jewish revolt against Rome in 66 to 70 AD. He would have been around for many of the events of the construction and propagation of the early Christian church. Not only that, he most likely would have known or come into contact with people who met or had experiences with Jesus firsthand. Now, Tacitus uh, connects the persecution of a religious uprising of Christus followers by Nero with the crucifixion of Jesus by Pilate, the governor of Judea. Tacitus was writing from a Roman point of view, a view that was derisive of Christ and Christ followers for the most part at that time. But Tacitus still confirmed the existence of Jesus and the historicity of many major events recorded in the New Testament. And while there is no direct evidence for the person of Jesus Christ himself in archaeological records, even skeptics of Christ's divinity would say that that doesn't really matter. Um, in fact, one of the leading skeptics of Christ's divinity would admit the lack of evidence does not mean a person at the time didn't exist. It means that they, like 99.99% .99 of the rest of the world at the time, made no impact on the archaeological record personally. Now that said, archaeologists have found towns, evidence of Roman crucifixions, many other historical locations and artifacts pointing to the legitimacy of events and places mentioned in the Gospels. There are other mentions of Jesus in history uh, of the time. There's a lot more to go into, but if you're into that sort of thing, you can go digging for yourself, or I can point you to some good resources that discuss this stuff further. But we can have faith that Jesus existed. So now that we can have faith that Jesus existed, now we have to know if he really was who he said he was. Um, but some people will argue that Jesus never said some of the things that we attribute to him. In fact, some people will say that Jesus never claimed divinity, that he never claimed to be God or the son of God, that Jesus was just a religious leader or a wise teacher. They will say that Jesus never comes out and directly says that he's God or the son of God. Did Jesus claim to be God? Yeah, I'll be honest. There's sometimes that I wonder what scripture people are reading or not reading before they come up with certain things. Uh, but let's just pick a few greatest hits in this category that might give us a clue as to what Jesus claimed or didn't claim. We'll start with John chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. So the Jewish leaders began harassing Jesus for breaking the Sabbath rules. But Jesus replied, my father is always working, and so am I. So the Jewish leaders tried all the harder to find a way to kill him. For he not only broke the Sabbath, he called God his father, thereby making himself equal with God. Now, I don't know about you, that seems pretty direct to me. He says God is his dad. The leaders seem to think that Jesus is implying that he's on equal footing with God. I don't know. Maybe there was some kind of misunderstanding, though. Maybe there was some kind of mistake. Somebody took something Jesus said out of context or something. So Jesus explained, I tell you the truth, the son can do nothing by himself. He only does what he sees the father doing. Whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son and shows him everything he is doing. In fact, the father will show him how to do even greater works than healing this man then you will truly be astonished. For just as the father gives life to those he raises from the dead, so the son gives life to anyone he wants. In addition, the father judges no one. Instead, he has given the son absolute authority to judge so that everyone will honor the son just as they honor the father. An equal footing with God does seem to be what Jesus is indeed claiming here. Anyone who does not honor the Son is certainly not honoring the Father who sent him. This does not appear to be rhetoric. This appears to be Jesus saying, God is my dad. Don't get it twisted. I do what I do because I have God's power. But, but let's just make sure we've got what Jesus is saying right here. I tell you the truth. Those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins, but they have already passed from death into life. Okay, only God had the power to forgive sins. The Pharisees knew 
and believed this. Here's Jesus saying that forgiving sins is his business and business is good. It seems like Jesus is claiming divinity on the level of God, yes? And I assure you that the time is coming. Indeed, it's here now when the dead will hear my voice, the voice of the Son of God, and those who listen will live. The Father has life in himself, and he has granted that same life-giving power to his Son. And he has given him authority to judge everyone because he is the Son of Man. Don't be so surprised. And by the way, I love this when there's like little asides, when Jesus is obviously responding to the reactions of Pharisees or the crowd, because their jaws must be on the floor after what he said, right? They must have been having, as my grandmother would have said, a conniption fit. And, and Jesus is like, don't be so surprised. And then he hits them with even more. Indeed, the time is coming when all the dead in their graves will hear the voice of God's son and they will rise again. Those who have done good will rise to experience eternal life. Those who have continued in evil will rise to experience judgment. I could do nothing on my own. I judge as God tells me. Therefore, my judgment is just because I carry out the will of the one who sent me, not my own will. Claims of divinity. Claims to be equal with God. God's son, God's power in Jesus, responsible for judgment and the resurrection of the dead. This does not seem like Jesus is just claiming to be a good teacher or an advice guru. What else do we have along these lines? John chapter 10, verse 22. It was now winter and Jesus was in Jerusalem at the time of Hanukkah, the festival of dedication. He was in the temple walking through the section known as Solomon's Colonnade. The people surrounded him and asked, how long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus replied, I have already told you, and you don't believe me. The proof is the work I do in my Father's name. Okay, so not just his teachings. His proof is miracles, and we'll get to those later. But you don't believe me because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me for my father has given them to me and he is more powerful than anyone else. No one can snatch them from my father's hand. The father and I are one. Ding, 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 ding. There it is. Claims of equality with God. Once again, power over judgment and life and death and eternal life and the miracles come from God. And you can check out the people's reaction in the temple they knew exactly what Jesus was saying. This was not exactly subtle. This was not, you know, hey, tell us plainly, are you the Messiah? Eh, I'll tell you later. Maybe, maybe not. Jesus was being abundantly clear with his claims here. So clear that once again, the people picked up stones to kill him. Jesus said, at my father's direction, I have done many good works. For which one are you going to stone me? They replied, we're stoning you not for any good work, but for blasphemy. You, a mere man, claim to be God. There is no question as to what Jesus was claiming anymore. You can actually go down a little bit further into the chapter where the dialogue is still proceeding between Jesus and the crowd, where Jesus says, why do you call it blasphemy when I say I am the son of God? After all, the father set me apart and sent me into the world. Don't believe me unless I carry out my father's work. But if I do his work, believe in the evidence of the miraculous works I have done, even if you don't believe me. Then you will know and understand that the father is in me and I am in the father. People are not trying to arrest and stone Jesus because he was doing good works or teaching good things or even that he was performing miracles. They're trying to arrest him and stone him for blasphemy, for claiming to be God. I and the Father are one. All right, beyond that, uh, Jesus makes some other unique claims that are tied to the assertion that he is God and he is God's son. Uh, Matthew chapter seven, verses 21 through 23. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and performed many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. 
In other words, Jesus is not only Lord, but he has the keys to the kingdom of heaven. He is the way in. Now, you, you've certainly heard this next one uh, if you've been coming to Seacoast for a while, but I think we often focus on the mission part of this passage and not what Jesus says right before. Um, and most Christians take it as a given, but we're just going to spell it out today. So uh, Matthew chapter 28. I, Jesus speaking, have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. Be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, that whole statement is powerful. But I mean, look at how Jesus prefaces it. I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Who has all the authority in heaven and on earth? God, right? Jesus, God's son. It's another unique claim. Now, all four gospels present many of the same events, especially with regard to Christ's death and resurrection and miracles and authority. And they're presented from slightly different perspectives, which not only strengthens the case for the reliability of the New Testament and the historicity of these ideas and events, but it hammers home this idea that Jesus made divine claims. These claims were not an accident, nor were they taken out of context. This is a common theme presented over and over in the Gospels, much to the chagrin of those who did not believe Jesus was the Messiah or the Son of God. Now, to be fair, there are some skeptics out there who reject the accounts of the Gospels altogether. And they kind of have a conspiracy theory here about Jesus' divinity. They assert this idea that Jesus' divinity was a story that was made up after his death and that despite what the Gospels say, Jesus never claimed to be God. And that instead, Jesus' death by crucifixion was a result of being a political insurrectionist, a perceived threat to the Roman government who was in charge at the time. Therefore, they turn the motive and meaning behind Jesus' death from a supernatural and spiritual one to a very human political one. But that doesn't really hold water, not even in extra biblical accounts. Uh, the Babylonian Talmud was a collection of Jewish rabbinical writings. Uh, these writings were put together between 70 AD to 200 AD. And in Sanhedrin volume 3, 43a, there appears to be a reference to Jesus. Uh, here he is referred to as Yeshu or Yeshua, the way Jesus' name would have been pronounced in Hebrew. And the passage reads, on the eve of the Passover, Yeshua was hanged. Now you may be thinking, hanged? Jesus was crucified. You sure we're talking about the same guy? We, we don't think of it this way today. We, we kind of make a clarification. But back in the day, that phrase could be and would be used to describe crucifixion. In Galatians chapter 3, Paul actually uses that turn of phrase. Then he was hung on the cross. He took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. For it is written in the scriptures, curse, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. And that last part is a reference to the Septuagint, the Greek translation uh, of uh, the Torah in Deuteronomy 21:23. All things considered, this instance in the Talmud is most likely a reference to Jesus. It's too much of a coincidence not to be. And why does it say he was executed? Well, it basically alludes that for 40 days leading up to Jesus' crucifixion, the Pharisees wanted to kill him for religious reasons. Here's what it says. For 40 days before the execution took place, a herald cried, he is going forth to be stoned because he has practiced sorcery and enticed Israel to apostasy. It's not about Rome or politics or power. It was on the basis of religious reasons. Jesus is performing miracles, but the Pharisees say that the power to perform his miracles didn't come from the God they worshiped, but rather from the evil one. And we see instances of this in scripture, like in Matthew 12. Um, but when the Pharisees heard about the miracle, they said, no wonder he can cast out demons. He gets his power from Satan, the prince of demons. And of course, the apostasy stems from Jesus's claims of being God and being one with God, being the way, the truth, and the life with the power to forgive sins, which the Pharisees took as blasphemy of the highest degree. Uh, Lucian of Samosata 
was a satirist in second century Greece. He was not a Christian. In fact, many of his works made fun of Christians. But he wrote this in one of his works, uh, The Death of Peregrine. The Christians worship a man to this day, the distinguished personage who introduced their novel rites and was crucified on that account. It was impressed on them by their original lawgiver that they are all brothers from the moment they are converted and deny the gods of Greece and worship the crucified sage and live after his laws. Once again, according to Lucian, Jesus was crucified for religious reasons, not political. And this goes right along with the gospel accounts. You know, Caiaphas, the high priest, hatches a plot to kill Jesus, but not during the Passover celebration of fear that people may riot. Judas agrees to betray Jesus. They bring Jesus before the Sanhedrin, the Jewish religious council, to stand trial. They take Jesus to Pilate, a Roman governor. If Jesus' death would have been for political reasons, you would think that Pilate would have handled it immediately. Instead, in Luke 23, 4, we read this. Pilate turned to the leading priests and to the crowd and said, I find nothing wrong with this man. But the council accuses Jesus of starting riots. Pilate finds out that Jesus is from Galilee, so he sends Jesus to Herod Antipas, which was under Herod's jurisdiction. Herod was the official ruler of the client state Galilee as appointed by Caesar Augustus. So again, you'd think, if Jesus were a political rival, if he was a political threat, if there was any danger to Rome's power, Jesus would have been a political martyr there. Herod would put Jesus down if Pilate couldn't. But Herod just puts a royal robe on Jesus and sends him back to Pilate. And then we're told, Pilate called together the leading priests. Who is he referring to? The priests, the religious leaders, along with the people, and he announced his verdict. You brought this man to me, accusing him of leading a revolt. I have examined him thoroughly on this point in your presence and find him innocent. Uh, innocent. Herod came to the same conclusion and sent him back to us. Nothing this man has done calls for the death penalty, so I will have him flogged and then I will release him. But it is the crowd of religious people and the council that continues to advocate for Jesus' death and gets Pilate to release Barabbas, a true insurrectionist and murderer, rather than Jesus. Make no mistake, Jesus was crucified for claiming to be God. We can have faith that Jesus claimed to be one with God and the Son of God. Jesus existed, and Jesus claimed to be one with God, the Son of God, to have all authority in heaven and earth. Now the question is, are Jesus' claims true? Now look, I'm a pastor. I've been one for almost 20 years. I've been a Christian for more than double that time. What I believe is probably pretty obvious. What you believe, in my opinion, is the most important, most influential, most consequential decision of your life and your afterlife. Who is Jesus to you? Is he just a historical teacher, a first century rabbi, or is he who he claimed to be? Uh, C.S. Lewis is one of my favorite authors. Um, not only is he the author of the Chronicles of Narnia fantasy series, he's also a lay theologian who wrote many great books about Jesus and Christianity. He said this, quote, Christianity, if false, is of no importance, and if true, of infinite importance. The only thing it cannot be is moderately important. And Christianity hinges on the truth of the claims of Jesus Christ himself. Um, C.S. Lewis also kind of broke down the choices of uh, who we could or should see Jesus as. It's an idea known as the liar, lunatic, or lord argument. Uh, you can find this in Lewis's Mere Christianity. And this is what he says, quote, I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. 
You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Now, it seems to me obvious that he was neither a lunatic nor a fiend. And consequently, however strange or terrifying or unlikely it may seem, I have to accept the view that he was and is God. End quote. Now, there's an element of faith in this decision but it is a reasonable faith. We can have faith that Jesus claimed to be God. Can we have a reasonable faith in that claim? Are there things that would point to that being the truth, the same truth that C.S. Lewis arrived at? Yes, in spades. And we will talk about some of the reasons we can have reasonable faith in Jesus' claims next week. Ah, all right. <laughs> But right now, I want to give you the chance. You know, maybe, maybe you're sitting there. Maybe you've heard a lot of this stuff. Maybe you don't need additional proofs. Maybe you've already arrived at C.S. Lewis's conclusion that Jesus was and is God. Maybe you have already had a personal encounter with him. And maybe you've just been waiting for the right time to make him the Lord of your life. You don't have to wait until next week. You don't have to wait another day. If you want to make Jesus the Lord of your life, if you want to accept the life-giving gift of eternal and abundant life, forgiveness of sin, restoration to God our Father, Holy Spirit inside of you to lead you and guide you, all of the things afforded to us by Christ's love and his sacrifice and resurrection, then you can pray this prayer right after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I know I've done wrong things. Please forgive me of my sins. Right now, I ask you to be my personal Savior. Be the Lord of my life. Lord, help me to turn from my sins and follow you. I thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. And I thank you for rising again on the third day and taking those sins away. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for preparing a place for me up in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, if you just prayed that prayer, I want to let you know how happy I am for you. And also how much I believe Jesus is not only going to increase your faith, but also your love and joy in him and through him each and every week. Uh, I would love the chance to pray with you as you start your new journey. Uh, if you've got questions, maybe you want to get baptized, maybe you want to get more involved with Seacoast, uh, if there's any way that we can help you out, uh, even if you didn't pray that prayer, uh, we want to be a church that helps. Uh, so please, come see me after the service, uh, or if you're not on campus or you prefer a different way, uh, you can always email me. My email is josh at seacoastredondo.com.